would you like your loved one to to make it for you? You wouldn't want your loved one to make it for you. Let's say you're let's say you were cooking for your mom. Okay, you're gonna treat your mom, you're cooking for her, making something for her. Or you're buying something for her. Would you buy something that she doesn't like? You wouldn't. Just out of what? Not out of a principle, like not it's just out of like love, you wouldn't do that. So when something is makruh, it's makruh in the shak- in sacred law that we're saying that the, the jurist, the scholar is saying, we believe in the eyes of Allah this is disliked. That means Allah doesn't like it. So when we say, oh, it's just makruh, like, okay, who cares? Like, oh, smoking, you know, what, what is it? Is this haram or is it makruh? You know, so we, we, we throw around the word makruh very lightly. And there's another extreme as well, right, in which something could be disliked according to one school of thought. And then when, when you say makruh tahriman, you have to understand if there are differences of opinion about something, then you don't condemn that person as if they're doing something haram. But you yourself, if you follow that school, then you try to observe that to the best of your ability, right? But you cannot then um, say something that is not absolutely haram. You cannot call it haram. That's the main thing. So we still avoid it as though it's unlawful though, out of love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and respect for the sacred law. So that's the introduction, an introduction today's, to today's topic. So the first thing, so he's going to... Um, what is going to happen is Imam Nahlawi lists a number of times in which speaking is makru or offensive. The first one he mentions is interrupting oneself and others. So it actually what it means is interrupting someone else or oneself. And this is very interesting because, you know, when you're speaking, like for example, let's say, you know, right now I'm speaking. Um... If someone was to just interrupt, completely interrupt it, you know, that would be considered like offensive. If someone was asking a question and someone interrupted that person asking a question, that's also considered offensive. So it's a time, you know, the, the, the respect that Islam gives people is that when someone is speaking, give them the chance to say what they have to say. It is a type of belittling someone when you interrupt them. What you're really saying is, I don't think you're important. Or I don't value what you have to say. And I think I am more important. And what I have to say is more important than what you have to say. So there's a type of arrogance. I mean, this is when you don't have any need. Sometimes you have to interrupt somebody. And and we'll talk about that. So Imam Nahlawi says it is offensive to interrupt someone else's words with one's own words when it consists of like the person is teaching sacred knowledge. So especially in that case. So just normally speaking, you shouldn't interrupt people. Of course, there's always a little level of, you know, when, you, when you're in a conversation, you know, you're both excited to say something and hey, what, you know, and so you kind of cut into another person. And what do you say politely? You realize you cut them off and they say, oh, sorry, sorry to cut you off. I didn't mean to cut you off, but I just want to say something. Okay, that's like fine, you know. Someone like, you know, my, my son says to me, Baba, I'm like, wait, you're just interrupting me. He said, Baba, if I don't say it, I'm going to forget. <laughs> you know, that's not a good thing. But, you know, it's a, in, a, in a sense that it's a kind of a give and take of conversation. Uh, but in reality, uh, you're not supposed to cut people off. I, I remember when I first went abroad overseas, but this is bad. No, even, even, even a little while into it, I had the habit of doing that. Because if you are a person who's a motor mouth, like, like I am, then... Um, you tend to have something you want to say before the other person is saying it. In fact, what you realize and what I realize is you're not even sometimes interested in what the other person is saying. You just want to put your point quickly. And so as a person, like the, 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 the worst, like the most torturous thing to a motor mouth is someone who takes their time when they speak. You're like, okay, all right, all right. Just say something because I want to say what I want to say. And then you realize this is a very arrogant way of being. And sometimes we think we're overeducated or we know more. The other person's older. And you're just like, all right, all right, quick, 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 get it, get it over with. And so this is part of the adab of Islam, that we give someone time to finish what they're saying. So, but it's especially the worst type of interruption is when someone is speaking about Allah, speaking about the Prophet ﷺ, sacred knowledge, and you interrupt in that gathering, right? Um, like, for example, I saw someone I remember one of my earliest memories as a Muslim, subhanAllah, is right after I'd taken my shahada, I, I went into a, um, I went into, uh, you know what happened? It was at Nugget Mosque in, in Scarborough. Sheikh Hamza Yusuf came. He gave a khutbah. It was, it was like one of those awesome khutbahs, like early Sheikh Hamza, you know. And um, 
And it was really going good. It was really going well. And somebody from the audience just got up and started to heckle. And he said, he, he interrupted the khutbah. And we're going to talk about that. That's a separate category, but I'll just mention it here. He interrupted it. And so Sheikh Hamza stopped. And he's like, he's giving the khutbah on the member. And there's thousands, there's maybe a thousand people there. He stopped and he responded to the person to try to like, okay, let's keep going. You're right. Okay, let's, let's keep going. And then the person went again. And then he just finally just sat down. And he, did, he didn't give the rest of the khutbah. And he didn't even lead the prayer. He just said, forget it, I'm done. Like, I'm coming all that way. And you know what he said that was really, really inspiring to me until this day? Every, the, the whole masjid broke out in pandemonium. It's the middle of the Friday. It was pandemonium because everyone was like, a guy from all the way in the back, he's not even in the hall of the masjid. He was in the, I don't know if you've seen this, it's a huge masjid area and there's like an outside shoes area. From there he got up to, 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 to heckle and to interrupt because he didn't agree with something that was said. And it was something, it was, you know, it wasn't anything you have to inter- disagree with. And everyone was like, oh, come on. Why did, you know, first they were like, Sheikh Hamza, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. You know, please. And he was like, no, I'm done. And the, the imam, you go f- complete the prayer. And, uh, and then everybody got angry at the, at the guy who was doing that. And, and then he got up and said, I have to protect my heart. Meaning, you know, you're in a place where someone's interrupting you and you're in the middle of a majlis. You're in the middle of preaching about ilm. You're talking about Allah and his Rasul, sallallahu on the member of Rasul, sallallahu alayhi and somebody cuts you off, it just completely breaks the, the, the tone of the majlis. And at that point, are you answering now from your nafs? Or are you, are you, how are you going to deal with that? And so he actually withdrew from that, which is a very big lesson for me. So people interrupting could be done rudely. And it could be done even in a, in a, in a foolish fashion. You know? Now, uh, he continues, some scholars hold that to greet even a group of people when they're learning religious knowledge with assalamu alaikum is a sin. What that would mean is somebody who comes into the gathering and says, Assalamu alaikum, and everyone has to turn around. Wa alaikum salam. That's not something that you should do. And I, I have seen this being done because when people have not studied these rulings, like we were in a majlis of hadith in which, you know, the, the, um, the sheikh is narrating a book of hadith and we are listening to the hadith to get the chain back to the Prophet ﷺ. In fact, alhamdulillah, we, we, we narrate in, on Saturdays um, uh, Imam Tirmidhi's Shema'il. And, you know, sometimes people coming in would just be like, they think it's a pious thing to do because we're supposed to give salam. So you walk in and everybody, salam alaikum. Now everybody has to turn around and look at you because you salamed everybody and everyone has to, now they're like unsure. The, sh- the, 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 the person teaching is caught off guard. So this is also something that can be offensive in that case. Same thing when you walk into a masjid. If you walk into a masjid and people are looking around and everyone's casual, salam alaikum, how are you? If everyone's like reading Quran, everyone's in their prayer, you know, on the 27th night you walk in, Salaam alaikum to the masjid. It's, it's interrupting people. The other thing is it's offensive to even interrupt one's own words with speech of a different kind when you're reciting Quran, when you're supplicating, meaning making dua, when you're explaining the Quran, giving a dars of tafsir, teaching hadith, or addressing people, meaning giving a khutbah. And while doing this, for example, you turn to someone and tell them to go buy something you need at home. That's the exact Mas'ala that's given. So for example, like, let's say, this is just for an example. You know, you're teaching something, you're talking about Allah and His Rasul, Sallallahu Deen. And then you pick up the, oh, yeah, 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 listen. Yeah, just grab an extra bag of milk, all right? Yeah, all right, take care. So, you know, you wouldn't do that, you know? Or you wouldn't be like, oh, guys, oh, I really got to take this. Sell the stock, quick. You know, like, you wouldn't do that. And in fact, even when, you, when, when you're speaking to somebody, and this is one of the things I noticed, um, being gone for so long, I, I resisted getting a cell phone for um, uh, a smartphone for a long time, even a mobile phone for a long time. And what I noticed is um, when you come back, uh, you know, people now they speak to each other like like th- like kind of like kind of like this. Do you know what I mean? It's like if you're talking to certain type certain people, and you know that that person doesn't have regard for the fact that they're with you, that they're in front of you. Or and someone another speaker made this very good point. Um, you know that the person is not fully with you if, you know, you take a break for one second, like you have to blow your nose and they're just like. And another thing is I do this too because it's become, I realize I do this sometimes because now even me, I'm just always plugged in. So there's a type of interruption that's not even, you don't even say anything now. I mean, this, the book is saying you're saying something, but there's a way of interrupting by just doing something else and you break the flow of conversation, right? Uh, Anyway, that, that can go into a whole different direction. 
So, so the thing is that we should not try to even interrupt our own speech. Now, conversation, let's see where we are in our slides. OK. So even while you're making your dhikr, now if you have to do it, we'll, we'll talk about it. Sometimes you have to do that. So someone's making dhikr, and you know, you're telling your kid, oh, don't do this. Or if, if, you, don't, if you don't engage in the worldly talk, you're just not going to get anything done. Like a, a, a busy mom or a busy dad, they're making their dhikr. You know, they, they want to get it in. And they still have to tell their kids, you know, hey, watch out. Like, don't fall. Don't do this. Hey, go over here. So the best thing to do is take a pause, say what you have to say, go compose yourself, and then start back again, right? Rather than trying to blend all of those things at once, subhanAllah. And uh, the other thing is that now, the, uh, he goes on and says, conversation is offensive for anyone seated listening to a pious exhortation, meaning a speech or some sort of giving dawah or something like that, or instruction, or in the presence of someone above his own level. So where were we? So even during a lesson or talk, to speak to each other, it's offensive to do that. Because you know, you're sitting in, in the audience of someone and you're engaged with them. And if obviously if you start doing like talking to each other, that that distracts the the person who's giving the lesson, distracts other people. So even that's offensive to do, right? And the other thing is that, um, and the other one is this, like, now this is the weird thing. So it's become something where in the khutbah, Friday khutbah, like, you know, it's wajib to listen to, can't talk. And you have people, while you're on the mimbar, they're just, they're going like this. Basically, only when the iqama is called, they'll be like, like that. And literally, so it's like, you know, there's, a, there's something about being literal that your words are interrupting, um, but then there's also, you're interrupting in a different way, or you're just having conversation and you're not listening to what's being done. If you want to speak to somebody, just get up and go outside. That's the that's the most respectable thing to do. Um, especially as well, uh, answering phone calls in like a gathering. And I don't know if you guys have seen that before. Like, you know, people are like, uh, yes, hello, 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 yes. And they're walking, walking out like, yeah, okay. Uh, and that also uh, interrupts a, a gathering. It is also, and then the other thing they mentioned, it is so during a lesson or talk, and when seated in front of someone above one's level, what is that supposed to mean? Above your level. What does that mean? Okay. What? Anything else? Older. What else? Yeah. So wait. But does it, is there such thing as be, being above one's level? Like, I thought everyone's on my level. Like, I thought everyone are all the same. No, stuck for Allah. No, no, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. No. I, I, won't, I won't admit that for myself. But I mean, say, what I'm saying, what, what they're saying here is, um, yeah, like Sheikh Faraz, for example, if he's sitting, I, I won't, you know, uh, we're having a conversation right now, you know, I, I, although I have the mic, I know it's kind of unfair. <laughs> but, you know, Sheikh Faraz here, you know, and you're set, someone's sitting there, you're not going to, you know, go out. And so the thing is that they're speaking, they're not speaking about a, a dars here, but even when seated in front of somebody and they are, they are talking, actually, they considered it um, poor manners to, to start like you start blah, 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 and the other person who's older than you either more knowledgeable than you, res more respectable in different ways that you just start going off and speaking. But what this, what this has to recognize is that there are levels in pe with people. And this is something that they have tried to kind of bulldoze in some societies. Yes, there, there is egalitarianism in terms of laws, in terms of sacred law and respect, but there is an idea of adab in Islam and there are levels of, 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 of how you interact with people. And it's very important as well not to overemphasize that. So like I said, I consider us, all of us, you know, we're brothers and sisters, you know, but like some pious elderly sheikh comes, you know, you, you give them that respect. You don't, you don't start talking before they talk. Even your parents, you know, subhanAllah, we've forgotten that level of, uh, of respect because we become so familiar with them. But when you look at traditional cultures um, and when you look at, you know, when the elder is seated in the house, like I remember... Um, SubhanAllah, I hadn't seen this situation in a long time. I went with my dad back to India, I took him back to India, you know, and he hadn't been like 30 years, and he was the elder of the family now. And I saw how people, my cousins who are in their 50s, old, much older than me even, everyone's just, 
quiet in front of someone who's older than you. And you allow them to begin first, or you know, you spit you begin by some gentle speech. So this is the thing that, that they mentioned that there is a uh, there is this idea of having conversation, you know, um, on the side when someone else is there, you, you give them that respect, turn to them. Unless they're okay with it, then that's a different story. It is also offensive for such a person to merely turn to look at someone else or to stir when there is no need, all of which is poor manners, like levity, which I guess means like being nonchalant, and preci uh, precipitateness, okay, <laughs> and thoughtlessness. Masha Sheikh is a very high level uh, English translator. So, so um, if you look at it in, um, in the Arabic, su adab, bad manners, khiffa, not caring, ajala, haste, and safa, foolishness. So what that means is even when you know, uh, you're know you talking to somebody, the adab of Islam is that you're not constantly turning to look around at everything else. Because it's very hard to talk to somebody and they're just always looking around like this. You, what you even notice sometimes, subhanAllah, you know, when you're in a gathering and you meet people and you're, tr you're talking to them, the Prophet would give his entire face to the person he's talking to. But nowadays people stand at a V in, an, in a public event. Have you noticed that? So they're not going to stand facing each other, they stand like this to each other. So in case someone else comes, they don't miss the conversation or miss some of the action of other people they want to talk to. I don't know if you try next time you go to the masjid on, on Friday, you come out of a place, you know, people stand in such a way that you're always ready to give your attention to someone else. Whereas, you know, you, when you talk to someone, devote your attention to that person, make them feel good, unless there are others around you're trying to include. And, um, and fidgeting around uh, when, you're not, when it's not needed. Rather, one should set forth. The other thing to, that the person should do is set forth what you have to say without irrelevant asides until you finish speaking. And the person who is being addressed should listen until that person finishes talking without stirring or talking themselves, especially if the speaker is explaining the words of Allah and his messenger وسلم. So even your own self, it's considered bad manners to interrupt your own speech by irrelevant asides. It's just not, it's not, not, not talking about sinfulness here. We're just talking about a person with purpose and a person with, you know, maturity will speak in a straight line and, and get to the end of an idea. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't have a tangent, but what it means is irrelevant asides, you know, you should speak and the other person should listen. And that's how you prevent people interrupting you. Be a person of, of uh, determined speech and people will listen to you. The problem is when people, everyone's kind of floating around in their speech, then you're more likely to be interrupted by other people, right? So give people that respect. Uh, don't keep watching, looking at your watch or, you know, do, uh, looking at your phone. It, but however, and then he, met, he ends with this, he says, um, necessity, whether it's physical or it's religious, that excuses a person, you know, when needed to the degree needed. So what that means is uh, you can interrupt somebody, for example, if there's a, a physical relig religious need. You know, you're in a classroom, somebody puts up their hand, excuse me, sir, you know, can I just go to the bathroom? Now they just go, like, you know, you know, it's like, Okay, if that's how the teacher prefers it, that's fine, you know, but if you have to, you know, uh, put up your hand, because it's adab in a majlis, actually technically speaking, maybe not here in the West, you know, you need to go to the bathroom, you go, you don't need to ask. But in, in traditional majlis, in, in, uh, in a traditional setting, you would request permission to leave, even if it's just by going, even if it's just by going, and the, and the, and the sheikh, you know, understands. Um, that's the adab. Um, for example, as well, you know, you're in a situation where um, you have to interrupt because, you know, something something urgent that the person needs to know. Some, someone's giving a lesson, but someone has blocked the parking lot. Somebody can't get out or something. That's, you know, that's that person's fault. You know, now you, what are you going to do? You can't say, OK, we have to wait until the end of the seminar. You know, three hours, someone has to leave you know, whatever. So you just go and you slip a note to the person who says, excuse me. So there's a polite way of doing it. Whenever there's a physical or religious religious need that arises to interrupt, that's that's you can do that. To interrupt yourself as well. Oh, so I really need to take this call. Do you mind? Okay. You know, like, you know, that that's, that's okay to do because if you do it when there's only a need, then people know that it's not being done because you don't care about them or you don't, you don't respect them or that you're not a respectable person yourself. The next thing, the next topic, and we'll, we'll get to questions at the end, or if people have them, they can just put up their hands as well. The next topic is disrespect to those in authority over one. Okay, 
And the way that you say this is uh, Literally what it means is In the Arabic A follower talking back to the person They are supposed to follow Okay, but what we can generally say is Disrespect to someone who is an authority over you And And it is offensive To It is offensive to contend against the words Of someone who is an authority over you Right What we mean by authority over you I.e. What the Sharia says, this person is an authority over you. Not like the village bully or something like that, or, you know, in a situation where someone has forced themselves over you, but in a place in sacred law where, you know, you should be respecting and listening to this person. And either to, to, um, to contend against them, to talk back to them, to oppose them for no reason, to rebut them or disobey them in anything that is lawful. Let's get to that. In anything that is lawful. What does that mean? So that means like, you know, your, your, your parents ask you, hey, you know, can you, just, um, can you just take out the trash? So to say, you know, contending would be like, you know, why do I have to do it? Why can't somebody else do it? You know, um, talking back, opposing. No, I'm not, you know, I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. Why should I do it? Or, um, or even disobeying and just saying, no, I'm not doing it. All those things are offensive. Of course, there's a level. Then you have to use your sense when it's haram and when it's just merely offensive. But this isn't anything that is lawful. Now, this not not only applies to parents and uh, and children, but where does it apply? It applies a follower with their leader. You know, so your imam, your khalifa, your government, your commander. You're in a you're in a you're in the army, for example. Your superior, right? That person is your, is, is your leader de facto. And so for you to be talking back to them, for you to be doing that to them in a way that is, in something that is lawful, is not, a, it, is, it is an offensive or disliked thing, right? A child with their parent, for example, that's, that's for sure, that, that could be haram. A student with their teacher, right? So it's like people arguing with their teachers and stuff like that, which is why as well, you don't see this so much in the religious context. Alhamdulillah, Muslims have a lot of adab. I'll tell you, mashallah. One thing I saw about when you come into Islam is that you notice the adab increase. And however, you know, when it comes into, um, we think that just because you're in public school or just because your teacher is not a Muslim or whatever, you can talk to them however you want. That's not true. This idea of like, oh, in front of the scholar or like the Molana or whatever, that's different. But when the person is just a secular teacher, just a prof, you can get up and heckle them before making some, you know, anti-woke statement or something like that. This is, not, this is not the Islamic way of doing something. That doesn't mean as well that you just let everything pass. You know, there may be times, for example, that it's very realistic that, you know, my daughter, for example, um, you know, subhanAllah, like first couple of months in Canada last year, um, you know, her teacher made an Islamophobic kind of like comment. And, you know, she respectfully engaged in class setting, but then she went afterwards to speak with them, you know. So you can you might have to do that. Excuse me, I just wanted to talk to you about this. Is it okay? You know, that's a, a, pr a respectful way of approaching it or taking it to an authority figure higher, to a principal or something like that or to your uh, HR in your company. It also, now, uh, because obviously we're talking in, about uh, traditional settings, Imam Nahlawi also mentions a wife with her husband. So this today might seem very difficult for a lot of people to understand or swallow. And what it means here is, um, I mean, I mean, sometimes you have to explain this, even though it's obvious to many people who understand traditional modes of family. It is that it is in the interest of a home and of a family that the husband and wife are cooperative with each other, right? It doesn't mean that a husband is, can be a tyrant or that he's an absolute dictator. And this also de depends, differs from culture to culture. In the time of my grandmother, who they're not Muslims, but even in Indian culture, you know, they kind of like, there was like an understanding that the husband was a sort of a, you know, he was the leader of the, of the home and you don't really talk back, you know, call him G and so on. You don't even refer to him by name or Suno, something like that. Like you say, excuse me, you know, you, there's a lot of adab and a lot of culture that's built up there. This doesn't mean that in every culture that has to be followed. Like now we're in North America and my wife has to call me, hey, listen, or excuse me, you know, sir, no. Or she has to call me Abu Muhammad or Abu Aisha. She doesn't have to do that because there's much more, there's more parity in the way that we speak to each other. But it doesn't mean as well 
that because there is a more a parody or egalitarianism in the way that we normally conduct our way, that we don't also try to lower the wing of humility towards each other. Because what that does as well, when we observe adab, it inspires the other person to take a higher, uh, a higher role of responsibility when needed. And this is when this is done with love, it creates harmony in the family. When this is done by throwing your weight around, this creates resentment, and that doesn't, and that breaks marriages and families. So there's a difference. You know, somebody was saying, you know, my, my teacher taught us that that um, a man does not need to throw his weight around to gain respect in the family. If he has to do that, it means there's something morally deficient with him first, and that's why your wife or your parents are not, or your, your children are not listening to you, right? So, so a person, by the way they behave, they inspire, inspire following. They inspire respect. The Prophet ﷺ did not have to tell people, you know, subhanAllah, they say, Sayyidina Anas Radhanu said, the Prophet ﷺ, never had to say to me, what, never said to me, why did you do that? Why did you do this? And he, was, he served him for 10 years as a boy. But it also shows that Sayyidina Anas never had to do anything where the Prophet had to say, why did you do that? Why did you do this? So when there's a harmony of respect in place, that it, it creates a good, a good balance. Um, so it's, it's important to remember that there is, there is a cultural adjustment in that, but there is obviously respect when the wife uh, uh, has that, gives that willing and loving uh, uh, kind of reminder of the leadership of the husband. That, that comes with more responsibilities and not to um, throw your weight around. Now, the other thing is, the other person is the unlearned person with a scholar. So in the similar situation, it, it's not considered like, so you see this a lot as well uh, in social media, right? Where people think, you know, they have like Sheikh so-and-so, he's got an Instagram page or a Facebook page, makes a statement, and all of a sudden people are like, you know, like talking in the comments as though like they forgot the calling by his first name or even worse his last name you know and you know as if it's like a football team you know and this guy is just an unlearned person challenging a person uh, and being rude to them and just like you know in that way even because it doesn't fit your religious sensibility or your sorry your political sensibilities or it doesn't fit some agenda that is current in that time this is something that is uh, unbecoming. Rather, even when you disagree with another scholar or you don't think what you think what they've said, let's say you, what they've said is totally out of touch. In fact, it's offensive. Scholars make offensive statements. Why can't they? They're not perfect people. Uh, but the way still is not to trash talk. The way is not to start getting down and mudslinging, you know? So the other thing is that you have to be careful. If you're a respectable person, you want to be, and, and you know, you might realize this, you know, the hard way watch where you get into your arguments and debates. You know, social media, we just had that seminar on Saturday. It's a, it's like, it's a mosh pit, you know? You know what a mosh pit is? Pre-pit. Okay. You know, basically, it's, it's, um, it's like the street. And if you go on to the level of, of heckling on the street, people are going to speak to you like that too. So just be, be, keep in mind that when you go to respectable places, you will be spoken to respectfully. But if you engage in conversation where the lowest common denominator rules... Um, then you're going to hear those kinds of words. So you have to protect yourself from that um, as well. Sometimes you just can't argue with somebody and you walk away and you say, salam. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where is this idea that different people have uh, levels over other people? A lot of times because of, I guess, almost like communist ideas, there's this idea that there's no such thing as scholar or elder or more respectable or someone more pious. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, أَهُمْ أَهُمْ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ Bismillah rahman rahim Ahum yaqasimuna rahmata rabbik Is it they who distrib- distribute the mercy of your Lord? Nahnu qasamna baynahum ma'ishatahum fil hayati dunya Allah says, it is we alone who have dis- distributed their livelihoods in this worldly life. Wa rafa'na ba'dahum fawqa ba'd fawqa ba'din darajatil yattakhidha ba'duhum ba'dan sukhriya and Allah says, it is we who have given them their livelihood, distributed their livelihood to them in this worldly life. And we have raised some of them over others in levels so that they can take each other in subordination to each other. And the mercy of your Lord is better than everything they amass. Meaning Allah in His, in his wisdom, just like He gave some people more rizq, more money than other people, He gave other people more authority than other people. And if when you break that down, society starts to break down. So this idea of subordination is a divine wisdom 
this idea that I have to, I have to, like, it's okay to feel under someone else. We, we, keep, we think nowadays that politician, no, he deserves no respect. A parents, no, it's all even with kids and parents. Scholar, uh, layperson, uh, it's all the same. In the eyes of Allah, the person who is following may be better. There's no doubt. They may be more pious. Uh, but in this situation, it's about the, the, the interest of community and the idea of respect to create a harmonious society. It does, it does not mean this person is rich, therefore I listen to them. See, we get it all backwards. That this person has physical power or they're coercive, so you have to listen to them. No, this is not the, the correct thing. So a scholar, let's say if they're behaving like a bully, that's not, that's not right. You know, your parent behaving like a bully, that's not correct. Husband behaving like a tyrant, that's not correct. Because everything that we've said here is in that which is lawful, not, which, not in that which is unlawful, right? So we'll just get to the, let's see, the next point, which is, now, so going back and forth and, and, and arguing back against people who you're supposed to be, you know, respectfully listening to, this is ugly behavior since obeying is wajib. And there's differences of opinion about exactly what is wajib and what is not wajib. Um, no one is saying that a woman has to obey every single thing her husband says. Uh, for example, um, there's there's differences of opinion about what the, the roles are, even parent and child. You know, can your parents, like, this is a whole other thing that we, we don't want to open up now, but a lot of people, you know, can my parents, you know, can your parents tell you to divorce your, your, your spouse or um, tell you to leave your university studies and this is what you need to do, you know, for example. So there are all these rulings and considerations, but the point is when it's in something lawful, it is wajib to obey generally speaking. And discipline is deserved when violated, right? So a child doesn't listen to a parent, then that child can be rebuked for that within, of course, the limits of that. This does not apply to anything unlawful or disliked. So no one can say that, oh, I had to do something haram because my husband said he wants me to do it. My, my dad said I have to, you know, take this usurious loan, therefore I'm just listening to him. The point of obeying someone, as they say, لَا طَاعَةَ لِمَخْلُوقِ بِمَعْسَةِ الْخَالِقِ There is no obeying the creation when it, when it comes to disobedience of the Creator. So you cannot obey creation if it means disobedience to your Creator, Allah Azza wa Jal. Any questions in general about that? We'll revisit that in the end, inshallah. The next uh, topic is worldly talk in the masjid, right? Kalam dunya fil masjid. What does what does it mean? So he says, "Women have kalam dunya fil masajid," and, and from among the offensive speech, because remember he's listing the different types of offensive speech. This speaking worldly talk in the masjid, eh? Kalam al mubah. We're talking about here permissible speech, because obviously haram speech in the masjid is haram. Of course, it's even more haram because you're in a sacred space. You're in a, you're in a special space. What we're talking about is speaking worldly permissible speech in the masjid bila uh, udhr, without excuse fa'innahu makru. Then that is something that is habitual. When there is no excuse, the note here is when one makes a habit of it. Right? And the more reliable a position is that it is not offensive. This is a note. Uh, that it is not offensive like makru sinful. It is merely khilaf al-awla. Better not to. So sometimes as well, when they're referring to disliked or offensive, they mean in terms of manners, right? It's better not. For example, you should say please in English, but it's kind of it could be offensive to ask someone for something without saying please. It doesn't mean it's sinful, right? So it's khilaf al-awla. It's it's suboptimal to do that. So what's an example of worldly talk in the masjid? You know, um, it doesn't mean that you can't meet someone in the masjid. Say salam alaikum, how you doing? How's everything? Oh my gosh, you've grown up. Oh, uh, that's not what it means because. The Prophet ﷺ used to greet delegations in the masjid. People used to have i'tikaf in the masjid. They used to live in the masjid, the, the Ashab al-Suffa. So it doesn't mean that you can't speak any permissible speech. What it means is you make a habit of it. So for example, the masjid is the air-conditioned place in the neighborhood. In some countries like that, or they have fans, you know. And so, you know, on a hot day, um, you get together and everyone's lying down in the back of the masjid and just hanging out. And, and you see this sometimes. Or like, you know, after the prayer, Everybody goes to the back of the mosque, in the masjid, in the proper, I should say. And let's talk about sports. Let's talk about the sports scores. Let's talk about politics. It's worldly speech. Someone else is trying to come inside the masjid. They're praying. And you're debating over who's a better basketball player. 
This is why it's offensive, because you're in that place. Now, the other thing is this. A lot of permissible speech can lead to something impermissible. If you keep talking, you'll notice something will come out of your mouth that's offensive. So now you're in the house of Allah, and you're speaking about permissible things, but your remembrance of Allah has gone. So now, what's the difference between the masjid and the coffee shop? Because you've turned the masjid into a clubhouse. And I've seen where they do this. Uh, in, in, in Venezuela once, I believe it was. Uh, I, I found, we, we, went, we went to a masjid, you know. It's like you basically turn it into a cultural club. And so you're not, it's like, you know, this idea of going to a masjid, but then everyone from your ethnic group is there. So therefore, let's all hang out. If you want to do that, the best thing to do is have the masjid and then have a cafe outside the masjid. One of the beautiful things I saw in Bosnia was um, uh, they have the masjid and then they, you come out of the masjid, out of the gates completely. And then you have a huge kind of like square and there's all these different tables. People are drinking coffee, smoking, talking, families are getting together, whatever. So do it outside the masjid, inside the masjid, you know, save that for the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, that refers to worldly uh, things inside the masjid. The next thing is al-kalam bi hal al-khutbah. Speaking during the Friday sermon. And he says, uh, even if during a fr Friday sermon, even to say tasbih, subhanallah, right? Or to send salawat on the Prophet sallallahu or to enjoin good or to command evil, right? And the, the, the essence of this is that you're supposed to listen carefully to the khutbah in Jummah. And because this is fard, this is wajib and fard, right? And why? Because this is what they say, that the two rakahs before the rakahs, uh, so Juma, as you know, is the khutbah and then two rakahs. And what our author is saying is that normally dhuhr is four rakahs. So two of those rakahs becomes a dhikr, a speech, a, a sermon on the khutbah. And the two other rakahs become the Friday prayer. So in essence, when the imam is on the mimbar and speaking, he is essentially in the dhikr of Allah. It's like you're in a state of prayer. This is why you're not even supposed to talk uh, until the imam gives salams, then you can speak. Uh, people often get this wrong. They think that even between the khutbah and when the prayer begins, you can talk. And I've seen this, unfortunately. I'm not really sure how to deal with it sometimes. You know, the, 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 the masjid wants to announce um, donations. They're calling for donations in between your khutbah and between the iqamah. Right? I have to figure out how to deal with that with hikmah because you're not supposed to be speaking. And what happens is when one person starts speaking or making announcements then everybody starts chattering, right? And all of a sudden the entire the whole idea of Friday khutbah is that you're hearing the words of Allah and Rasulullah some people for the only time that week. And you go right into the prayer and you throw that presence of heart that you have with Allah into your prayer. And that's why Juma feels so good. That's why it's so rejuvenating. But when you're breaking it, right, with speaking, that's, that kind of uh, breaks your, your focus and your presence with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even saying, this is why they say, even to say subhanallah, even to say, it's not like a normal speech, even to start giving salawat on the Prophet out loud, that would even be a type of uh, speaking during the Friday prayer, even though it's a good thing to say. Or for example, to say to someone else, you know, that's not the time to explain to someone, you know, why you know, you shouldn't have uh, an image on your t-shirt in the masjid or something like that. You should, you know, you should be reducing the speech. Now, sometimes it may be necessary for like someone like the, uh, the staff of the masjid. You have 2,000 people in the place and you're trying to tell people, don't block a fire exit. You know, please move forward, something like that. There may be, uh, there may be some exception for this. Um, and the other thing is, and, and so the Prophet ﷺ, but let's go to the hadith. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا قُلْتَ لِصَاحِبِكَ, لصاحبك يَمُ الْجُمْعَةَ uh, أَنْصِتْ وَالْإِمَامْ يَخْطُبْ فَقَدْ لَغَوْتْ When the imam is giving a sermon on Friday and you tell your companion, listen, you have made an impertinent remark. So even if someone's talking beside you and you go to them and you say, hey guys, listen to this khutbah, even that is lagu. Lagu means like vain speech, right? The most you can do, just tap them, look at them. But once you open your mouth to say something, then they say something back. What? What, what, what did I do wrong? Uh, 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 and it goes back and forth. So even like, you know, okay. But 
it's better to just um, pay attention. This also goes in a lesser in a, in 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 a way as well. Other ulama mentioned, though it's not mentioned in this book, that silence should be observed in all khutbas, the khutbah of Eid, the khutbah of Nikah, you know, for example. Um, uh, a khutbah in any other situation, you don't interrupt it. The next um, t- type of uh, offensive speech is speaking when the Quran is being recited. And I've got a story on this one. He says, and it is offensive to speak when the Quran is being recited because listening to it and heeding the Quran is absolutely obligatory, wajib mutlaqan, to listen to, whether one is performing the prayer or not or when, whether one comprehends it or not. So what does that mean? Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا قُرِئَ الْقُرْآنُ فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ وَأَنصِتُوا لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ When the Qur'an is recited, listen to it attentively and be silent so you may be shown mercy. Right? Because this is Allah's speech. Allah, when Allah, and essentially when someone is reciting the kalam of Allah, it is, it is out of respect for that that this is Allah's speech, that you, everyone stay quiet, right? This is why, subhanAllah, I remember, um, uh, subhanAllah, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things about this. This is why it's not good. For example, if we're talking about something here, and someone goes and starts to recite Quran loud in the corner. For example, like I had a halaqa today in, in one of the masjids, and someone's reciting, they start to recite loud in the corner of the masjid. That is not good to do, because out of respect, we have to be quiet to listen to them. Because you, you're not supposed to be reciting Quran and other people are talking. But a person who starts reciting when other people are speaking or in a place where they're supposed to be speaking, then that person who recites Quran, they get the sin of it. So going in the marketplace and start reciting the Quran very loud, you know, now everyone who's not listening, it's not them who's sinful, it's you who's sinful. But walking into a masjid, when someone's reciting Quran, prayer is happening, and you're in the back talking. So this is why like Surat Tarawih, you know, they're doing 20 rakahs, they're doing like a nice slow 20 rakahs, and you know, you're hanging out in the back, and you're ta- talking, talking, talking. It's actually offensive to do that. Because the Prophet Allah SWT says, uh, listen very carefully, right? Uh, it also, it, it doesn't even matter if you understand it or not. So some people are like, well, I don't understand what the Imam is saying. But it's Allah's words. So either you show, either you listen or you step outside, right? This is also why you, they should not um, broadcast Quran in a place where they know people will not listen to it. So we tend to think, this is just kind of going off into modern context. Uh, you tend to think that, oh, I'm in the Middle East. People are religious. So therefore, we should have Quran instead of elevator music. Okay? Let's be honest. When you're in a shopping mall, is anyone listening to Quran in a shopping mall? No one's going to listen to the Quran in a shopping mall. So this idea of, oh, such a soothing environment, we're shopping and we're listening to the words of Allah, <laughs> it's not like that. Why? Because the words of Allah, it should be, right? It's better to even less, listen less, but when you hear it, you stop. It, it, it holds you. When you hear Jannah, you stop. When you hear Jahannam, you're scared. You're making dua. That's how we're supposed to be interacting with the Quran. When we're, when we're hearing Allah's words, we're making dua and we're interacting with it. But uh, if it's just become something to play in the background, you begin to ignore it. But you have to be careful as well. So my, my, my shaykh taught, taught us that this is why, you know, if people are playing the Quran, uh, for example, in a barbershop, you know, you're, this is what they do. In barbershops in Jordan, you know, let's say they're playing on their TV. They're, they have like, you know, music and stuff like that on. When they see someone walk in who's religious as a respect to that person or like as a kind of a okay we shouldn't be doing this they, sw- they switch it all of a sudden to the Quran channel uh, the only thing with doing that is that they're talking over the Quran and making small talk while they're cutting the person's hair right so hey how's it going on the phone and everything so this is where it's actually we were advised it's actually better to say excuse me can you turn off the Quran do you mind because I want to speak to you and there's a polite way of doing this too of saying, I want, I just want to have a conversation with you, and I, you know, I, you know, oh, okay, okay, no problem. And there, it leaves them scratching their heads sometimes, like, wow, this guy's weird. I just turned the Quran on for him or her, and uh, but you have to be careful how you do this. Once I was in a taxi, and uh, I was escorting a student in Jordan. We have uh, uh, mostly American, British, uh, foreign university students, and I had to take this student home 
uh, escort her home. And so I grabbed a taxi and she sat in the back. I sat in the front as is customary in Jordan. And uh, we're driving and, you know, we have something to talk about. So you're in a taxi. It's your taxi. You have a right to talk in your taxi. So the, the person had the Quran on quite loud and I had to speak to this student for a reason. So I asked the person driving the taxi and taxi drivers like, mashallah, amazing when they love their Quran. So I said, excuse me, um, we're talking right now. If you don't mind, we just have to say something. Can you just please turn it off a little bit? I have to drop her off. Then, then, you know, then we can listen to it all we want. And this lady wasn't Muslim. So he got really upset by that. He got really upset. So he, he's like, you want me to turn off the Quran? I said, yeah, just, just, just two minutes. I'm just dropping her home. I need to give her an instruction and we'll play it after. Okay, like, like that. He was like, turned it off. She got out. Mashallah, he had enough sense that, okay, like an uh, American foreigner, let them go out. She went inside her house. I made sure it was dark. She got inside. Okay, no problem. We continued. Oh, then he got really upset. And I'm t that guy was about to punch me out. Like, no joke. And he was like, you know, like, I love the Quran. How dare you do this? You know, this is the thing. This is like, how can you do that? The Quran, what's better? Allah's words or your words? And I realized at that point, uh, and this is just something we can all share, that you may get an advice from your teachers that is technically more correct. But sometimes you have to be careful how you tell it to a person because they may take the wrong understanding and think that I was saying that, no, the speech of this person I'm speaking to this now, Muslim is more important. I don't like, I don't want you. And I was trying to tell, no, I'm just trying to preserve the sanctity of the Quran because I don't want someone in the back speaking to me and I'm speaking over them because I can't tell them to be quiet. I can be quiet. So I was just telling him just to preserve the sanctity. He was upset. Anyways, we ended up leaving, kissing each other's foreheads and everything. So it was fine when I explained it to him, but he was going to get really upset. So always have that, always, whenever you have like a, uh, and I learned this, that as a student, you might learn a fact and like you take that fact in your hand, like going around and like, yeah, like a cowboy, like whipping it on everybody. No, this is not how we do it. Um, we learn a fact and we sit with it. And we, things come up in our lives and we determine how, what's the best way to, to implement this with wisdom and in a way that doesn't make the situation worse. Um, and the next, uh, and of course it goes, goes without saying, don't put the Quran as your ringtone, you know, or something like that. Pick something else uh, as well. That's another thing. And the next thing is speaking without need. How much time do we have? Speaking without need to the opposite sex. Al-kalam ma'aghayri mahramin bila haja. And he says, it is offensive for a male to speak without need to a young woman who is not a member of his unmarriageable kin, his family. He should not say, Yarhamukumullah. Like, for example, she sneezes, he should not say, Yarhamukullah, if she sneezes, or greet her with Asalaamu Alaikum. Uh, and the note says, which is unlawful in the Shafi school, nor to return her salams if she says it to them. So, which is offensive for Shafis. Uh, he should not say these aloud, but rather he should reply to her within himself. Right? All of which likewise holds for a young woman speaking to a man who is not a member of her unmarriageable kin. The prohibition of these is due to the Prophet ﷺ having said, Al Lisanu Zinahul Kalam, that adultery, the adultery of the tongue is speaking. So, what does this mean? Does this mean we can't speak to each other anymore? It's not exactly that. What it's saying here is speaking without need. Um, for example, even in modern times, so in, in, in previous times, in traditional times, you basically did not meet non-mahram women. For example, when I lived in Yemen for some time, not only did I probably, how many times have I been, in six months, I might have spoken to a non-mahram, like maybe very few times, maybe when they answered the door. Um, and, and I didn't even see a woman's face for six months. That's a very conservative society. You know, where if I called, I called one of the, my teacher, I, I called him, I said, Salaamu Alaikum. And his wife answered the phone and she just said, Marhaba. So I, I said, Salaamu Alaikum. And she said, Marhaba. So I realized she's not going to salam me. So I, I was like, okay, I, I don't get this. Because from the West, we say, Salaamu Alaikum, Alaikum Salaam, how's it going? How are you? Um, now in that culture, it's Shafi'i Madhab, they don't do that. If it's somebody who's a stranger, they don't do that. Why? Because they don't want to open up the door between complete strangers for a type of intimacy. Because a salam is something that is very, it is a very special connection. That being said, so for example, you would walk up into a store, you wouldn't like, oh, assalamu alaikum, how are you sister? How's everything going? However, there are other Muslim cultures 
where if you don't do that, you're going to offend the sister. So somebody comes to my house, it's my wife's friend. If I don't say, Salaamu Alaikum, sister, how are you? Someone comes to the center, I don't say, Salaamu Alaikum, sister, how are you? How's everything okay? So that's, that's not considered a situation exactly like this. What they mean here, at least in our context, is you have no reason to speak to that person. So I'm walking around in square one. It's a mall here. And I'm walking around square one. I'm not going to go up to a random hijabi sister and say, oh, mashallah, hijabi. Salaamu Alaikum, sister, how you doing? You all right? Okay. You know, you're not going to do that because why? That's seen as what? That's seen as being flirtatious. That's, that could be bordering on harassment, right? So you wouldn't do that. In the same way, a lady walking by a man, young man, young woman, obviously that's a chance for fitna. So you don't go cross to each other and start salaming each other and saying, oh, you know, these types of things. If there's a reason or a purpose, you speak. And niceties and or you could say formalities, asking people how they are, these are considered, you know, part of an adab according to the culture that you're in. So when I was in Jordan, I worked, we had 100 teachers working in this place. You know, have 50, 60 female colleagues. It doesn't mean I'm going to walk in, go to, straight to my desk like this. No. You know, so that you have to understand what the context of what's being said and understand how to, uh, to balance that, right? And of course, this goes as well for uh, when you're online, right? So this, this is another thing on social media and stuff as well. Uh, speaking when the other one, the other one is, the next one is speaking when lovemaking or in the lavatory. You notice the word used is like a respectful way of saying it, not the thing it, that that you understand, which is al kalam in the jima wa in the qada al haja. So the, uh, there's a very very small note on this one. Uh, it is offensive to speak while lovemaking, in intercourse, or when in the lavatory or relieving oneself. Okay, one line, and that's like, move on to the next topic. So, uh, you know, let's talk about the, the bathroom one as an example. So, for example, when someone's in the bathroom, that's not the time to be like banging on the door. Yo, you want fries with that? You know, do you want to, you know, what do you want to do? Yo, we got, you know, we got, that's not time to speak to somebody and they're speaking to you. In fact, you know, sometimes you go to the, you go into a public bathroom and you're hearing a voice. You can't even hear, wh where's that voice coming from? In the stall, there's a guy talking on the phone. That's not the time to talk on the phone, right? It's not the time to do that. So, so the thing is that um, that's considered like actually, you know, bad manners. Not sinful, but it's considered bad manners, manners to do. And when someone's in the bathroom, you don't interrupt them. In the same way, when they mean uh, with uh, lovemaking between husband and wife, they're not saying necessarily husband and wife cannot say anything to each other explicitly. Of course, you don't start talking about irrelevant things. But the Prophet ﷺ said, you know, before one makes an advance to his wife, he sends a message. They said, what's that message? Kisses and kind words. So there is a type of an intimate speech and, and, and loving talk that's between a couple. But, you know, in this case, you don't, I mean, it's kind of almost inconceivable, but you wouldn't speak to somebody outside your room or, you know, um, answer a phone call or these types of things because it's an intimate moment, right? And also the other ruling is if it is uh, anything that it's, uh, it is offensive to laugh in any circumstance in which it is offensive to speak. So laughing occurs in this, unless, you know, the person in the dars makes a joke or something and you're supposed to laugh. Okay, so it's not offensive to laugh if, you, if the teacher makes a joke or if the khatib makes a joke. But laughing for other reasons, laughing uh, in general when you're not supposed to be laughing, that type of thing, when the Quran is being recited. Okay, I think we will, we will close that off here, inshallah. Uh, are there any questions about, in general, when it is offensive to speak there are many, probably a few more examples that are not mentioned in the book. And if you go to different books, you'll find them. But just for brevity, we kept it at that point. Yes. No. When they, sal when they say, Assalamu Alaikum, you should just say, you know, like that. Like, in your heart, you know. Because if everybody gets into greeting each other, all of a sudden it creates a little buzz, you know. Um, uh, and it's actually palpable. You can actually hear like a kind of a buzz. As soon as a talk finishes, you just hear the din of speaking start to rise. That's what you're trying to prevent. Um, that being said, there's also a question about, well, is the talk, sometimes, sometimes they have a talk before the khutbah. So they have like a speech before the khutbah. Um, it's not technically the khutbah. So, you know, like for example, someone else is giving a talk and then the imam is about to give a talk on the mimbar. But 
still you should respect when someone is there giving a speech. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because because you know you, yeah, that happens as well. Where people are very strict, they just won't even uh, look. Sometimes you know, it's just until you don't hurt the person's feelings. You just say, "Okay," you know. Um, but uh, yeah, actions. In fact, this was actually what was mentioned: stirring about and unnecessary actions is also offensive to do. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So the question here is, uh, you know, um, it has to do with environment when dealing with the opposite gender. Um, there's no doubt environment, culture, uh, local culture. So I wouldn't walk in to a place in a very conservative culture and start to say, Salam, how's, how's, how are your parents? They're okay? Okay, great. You're doing okay. How's the class going? They would you just almost pretend like you don't know each other. That's normal for there, and that's fine. Um, here, uh, it wouldn't be that case. In fact, you know, there are, it's, it is arguable to say over here, because Muslims are, my, are a minority, if it's in a, in a healthy and a wholesome way, and you can like uplift a person, like at, you're at work, and you're the only, it's you and the other sister, the only other Muslim at work. You know, you're not going to say, you know, and this is what, subhanAllah, Muslim women have complained about this as well. You know, that some that brothers, when they're very religious, like, you know, they're ignoring the Muslim sisters, and then with the non-Muslim sisters, like oh, all, all like uh, outgoing and like having a lot of oh, talking and laughing, and then with the Muslim sisters, like Shoo. part of it is because there is that little bit of taqwa. It's not because they don't like the Muslim sister or they don't respect her. It's part of because the way that she might be presenting herself gives them that awe that I don't want to cross the line in, in respect for this person. It's it's a type of awe that you hold, and I and 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 at the same time. Because we're in that society where, you know, people may not understand that, it's always best to treat people equally and not assume that one person doesn't want to say salam to you. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, does that make sense, what, what I'm saying? Yeah, this is a, it's a big topic. I think I might have opened it up, yeah. You yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the, because, of, because the people can't hear online what you're saying. So our brother was saying, Sufyan was saying that uh, he found it the opposite way, that uh, he found that he wasn't being nor being greeted, but his other uh, non-Muslim colleagues were. Yeah, because you've got the beard and, you know, you're... you're um, it happens. It happens. I mean, at the end of the day, if someone doesn't do that to you, just understand that they're not trying to offend you, right? At the same time, you know, understand that if you treat people differently, they may their feelings may be hurt, and they may not understand that you're trying to apply a level of traditional knowledge that they're not used to. Or there may be an interest, you know, it may be that that person's iman was just on a thread. And you said, Salaam alaikum, sister, or you just said, how are you? Are you okay? And something about it just boosted them up. But that doesn't give you a door to start flirting and talking in that way. So the imams are trying to, they're trying to speak for their context in which there's no real need for you to uplift someone's day by asking them how they are. But we're in a situation as a minority, you have MSA situations and stuff like that. It's about doing things with adab and modesty and then uh, interactions when they're purposeful, they can be beneficial, right? Any other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Mm 
-hmm. Yeah, so that's a good question. Where do you where do you draw them? So I, I have to repeat the question back so that they can hear. So where do you draw the line when it comes to worldly talk in the masjid? Because masjids are a place where brothers and sisters connect and there's a type of collective harmony that takes place inside a masjid. Is that is that kind of right? Yeah. So this is why they mentioned if it's if it becomes habitual. Sometimes as well, when we talk about something in fiqh, there are so many caveats that it takes a while for us to these questions are good because we jog back over the kind of like the uh, the details of it and get a, a fuller picture. So he mentioned as a note, it, it's when it becomes a habit. So if your you know sisters group on you know modern sisters issues in the world that's not religious meets in the masjid that becomes an issue like if my sports group meets in the masjid to discuss the maple leaves or whatever the raptors or whatever then that becomes an issue but when i meet people and greet them in the masjid i ask them how they're doing the prophet ﷺ would greet people in the masjid and he would ask them how are they do how are you doing and tell me this and people come would come to him with problems and so it's it, that uh, that amount of speech that is natural that's fine it's when you say, all right, guys, let's get our coffee and tea, sit inside the mosque, and let's talk. You don't really do that anymore in our time. I mean, subhanAllah, if people could just go to the masjid to hang out, that would be amazing. I mean, in the sense that it's not like old times where the masjid was like the big the big uh, building, air-conditioned, maybe it was the only one that had the fans, and everyone else lived in like tents. And you see what I'm saying? The masjid was a place where that people came to. Even now, if you go to a masjid in some parts of the world, like those big masajid, people are like having picnics on in one corner, you know, people are using it because it's the most lofty building. It's like a, a town square. So that's where, you know, using it like that is not, is not good. Like you don't go to have a picnic in the masjid. But if you are in i'tikaf, if you're, there's a halaqa that happened and they've put out a spread, it's not a habit. You get, you get what I'm saying? So don't make the, the, the masjid into your clubhouse, but you're definitely out to speak about, it doesn't mean um, I would ask you about how your school is doing, but I have to go outside. It's not like that. It's not that strict. And it's not an, on a level of sinfulness. It's on a, a level of adab. Because you may disturb other people praying and stuff like that. Any other questions, thoughts, ideas? Okay, anything from online? No? Okay. Jazakul khairan. Inshallah. Uh, next week, let's see. We're coming to the end of the book. And we will be speaking about... We're still in the area of when it's offensive. We're going to speak about speaking after... Dawn comes in before performing Fajr. We're going to speak about speaking after Isha prayer. Um, those two things are offensive. And when is it offensive to greet someone with Salam? So Salams is Sunnah. It's an act of worship to greet someone with Salam. When is it offensive to greet someone with Salams? And we're going to, you know, that's all that when, when a person is praying, when a person is teaching, when a person is eating, when a person, and it's just going, you know, it lists a number of things. Um, and when are you, when are you, when do you not have to respond to Salams? You know, do you have to respond to salams if someone who's intoxicated says it to you? Someone who's begging from you? And they're just saying salam to get your attention. Do you have to respond to that? Um, then he f then we're going to go to boasting and uh, revealing one's sins to other people, right? Which is in the offensive part. You notice it's not in the haram part. Some people get a waswasa about that. We'll talk about that. Revealing people's secrets and turning someone off from their family. We're going to talk about cursing. And then that will probably be all. And then the last one is begging. And then there's a section on music, song, and dance. So there are about two more classes or three more classes left, inshallah. See you guys next week. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.